Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. So-called sports reporting is a largely empty and meaningless occupation. Does anyone care what the sports scribblers have to say? Not really, and yet they have a lot of clout in the white media. And why is that? Because sports reporting has always been the place where racist white media figures could freely express their anti-black racism and use every stereotype and trope and denigrating description they wanted, largely without consequence. I would say that it's an open secret, but it's no secret at all. It's blatant. It's out front, and it's supposed to be. It's a celebration of being able to say what they really think about black people. The racially coded language is always on full display. White players are described as flamboyant, but black players are arrogant. When white players lose consistently, they're having a rough patch. Black players lose, and they're overrated. White players have an imperfect record, but black players are described as having a tainted record. And as for the word controversial, that label is almost universally applied only to black athletes. Most all the sports writers in the United States are white males, and there's a reason for that. They typically fall into one of two categories. You have the also-ran wannabe athletes who weren't good enough to make the team. And then you got the pencil-neck chumps who weren't even good enough to be the water boy. Both of them have a chip on their shoulders. And it's rooted in race. For the last 55 years or so, when children in America grow up, the first time that they get any attention from anyone outside the classroom is when the middle school basketball or football team plays. That's when the outside world actually notices these kids and treats them as something other than noisy brats. And who are the bulk of these athletes getting this attention? Black boys. Now, if you're a racist sports writer and you grew up from childhood having more than your black classmates and your parents know people because white power engineered that they would own the society, you would have an expectation that you're supposed to win because the society shows you as the winner. Everything from TV shows to movies to the faces we see as the political and academic leaders are almost entirely white and overwhelmingly white males. The white media engages in a nonstop celebration of whiteness. So imagine the shock for generation after generation the last half century, raised to believe, at least in their homes, that they were on the inside track. And the first time the outside world notices them, they see it's the black kids who had nothing, and they're the ones getting all the attention. Sports have always been dragged into the political realm because that's what a lot of the eugenics, white supremacist crowd from the 19th century wanted it to be. They wanted to certify that it was an undeniable proof of white superiority. Sports have also been problematic for American society because sports are a meritocracy. Unlike every other arena in the society, from schools to jobs to politics, what have you, white power doesn't have the ability to skew the outcome. You don't have racist administrators who can just choose for themselves who the winner is going to be, merit be damned, though on occasion they have tried it. Black Americans are the ones who have come to define what is the zeitgeist of sports. When talking about black athletes, they make sure to run them into the ground, call them names, say that they're selfish or undisciplined or lack class. It's not even racial dog whistling, it's a foghorn. And everyone understands that these racist white sports writers aren't actually talking about the athletes, they're talking about the black community. Everyone knows this. Whatever black athlete that they're running into the ground at the moment is merely a proxy. And you can tell by the words they use, not to mention how they talk about non-black athletes under the exact same circumstances. When the subject is a white athlete, they talk about nothing but the game, how great the player is, just an orgy of praise. Black athletes, on the other hand, is nothing but insults and racial stereotyping. And that is deliberate. Most recently, we had the case of the LSU women's basketball team. And actually, just black collegiate female athletes in general who have been targeted by these racist white sports writers who have been calling them every dog whistle in the book, and their online minions have been doing and signal boosting the same. This year's women's college basketball has been getting some traction, and more people than usual have been following it. Iowa's women's basketball team has had a number of wins, but the real story for these white sports writers has been that Iowa's team has been overwhelmingly white, with the standout being Caitlin Clark. These racist white sports writers have been coronating her for a couple of months now, and they've been dropping the racial code words heavy against all the college teams with black players. The abuse of the black female athletes has gotten so bad that even their black coaches have had to speak up, which is something that normally they never do. So, no matter who Iowa found themselves playing against this year, the white media narrative was already set. You have the wholesome, all-American white girls playing against the ghetto, thuggish black girls from fill-in-the-blank.
They had the narrative ready to go long before the championship. Caitlin Clark, by the way, was running around doing the John Cena, you can't see me facial gesture before, and not one white media sports writer said that she was classless, or that she was an idiot, or poor sportsmanship, or poor rural whatever. Where was all the whining at then? Oh, that's right. They didn't say anything, because they never do unless it's a black athlete that they can go in on. On a side note, John Cena culture vultured his entire wrestling gimmick from black people. Being some white hip-hopper wannabe, that was his ticket to ride. So every aspect of sports culture, at least the parts that are worth having, are what we as black people brought to the table. But while the white media was preparing to crown Caitlin Clark as the greatest female collegiate basketball player ever, something happened that they hadn't counted on. The real greatest women's collegiate basketball player ever showed up and beat Caitlin Clark like a red-headed stepchild. LSU women's basketball team, which has never had a championship, has been on a roll this season and leader of the pack was Angel Reese, who has been nicknamed Bayou Barbie. Now, we know that the white media goes into hysterics whenever they see black people getting any sort of praise or honor, especially if it's a black person who's defining themselves on their own terms, because that's what power is. As far as they're concerned, you're supposed to have whatever nickname we saddle you with, whatever label we put on you. You're not allowed to define yourself, because we know that you're not going to define yourself as lesser than. When they saw this young black woman winning, beating other teams, and they saw that she was being celebrated by the fans, as opposed to Caitlin Clark, who is only a white media darling, they couldn't stand it. And so we've seen this sick torrent of racial abuse being hurled at the LSU team, especially Angel Reese in particular. But we all know it has absolutely nothing to do with any gestures or anything that she was doing on the court. Trash talking has been a time-honored tradition in sports, all sports, and women's sports is no different. Tennis players often taunt and lampoon each other on the court in public, though where Serena Williams is concerned, her white counterparts make certain to use especially racist ridicule. For the longest time, female athletes, including female collegiate athletes, have complained that they're not getting the same respect as their male counterparts. Well, there is a reason for that. Female sports overall and female athletes don't draw the same numbers as their male counterparts unless it's tennis, and that's only Serena Williams who can do that. And this disparity between viewership is especially pronounced when you look at women's basketball, be it collegiate or professional. This year, things have vastly improved, however, at least for women's basketball, with ratings for the NCAA Women's Championship game being 9 million viewers on ESPN alone and as high as 12 million on all platforms, which is an all-time high for women's basketball, period. And while it's true that the men's NCAA game this season outperformed the women's with a viewership of 14.7 million watching it on CBS, that is the lowest watched championship game in the history of men's NCAA basketball. So why was the men's basketball championship viewership so low? I'll save you the suspense. The reason why is because it wasn't a compelling lineup. No great rivalry, no really standout players for that matter. And we saw the same thing with football, too. This is what happens whenever you have a matchup that people are looking at and going ho-hum. This, however, was not the case with women's NCAA basketball this season. People were watching it, and they were very interested in seeing who was going to go up against who. The major criticism against women's basketball is that they don't have the same level of play as the men. The shooting percentages are far lower than the men's, and the games are nothing but a bunch of layups with a few three-pointers sprinkled in there. And from an objective standpoint, yes, it is true the pace is slower. There's not the same explosive footwork, fast breaks, alley-oops, no-look passes, to say nothing of slam dunks. When you watch women's basketball, it's a totally different game from the men's. But then again, when you watch women's MMA, it's different too. It usually ends in a submission. There's almost never a first round knockout. Women's MMA is not about power. It's usually about grappling and outmaneuvering their opponent. I know it's odd to say, but women's MMA is probably the most graceful that combat sports ever gets. My point is, this is why, for me, a one-to-one -one comparison of men and women's basketball is a pointless exercise, though there are some people who still try it. Besides, as was shown this year, if the women perform at a certain level, they don't have to do all the things that the men do. They just have to make it clear that they play with competence and with the requisite level of aggression. Nobody should expect the women to do the high-flying moves or anything that the men do, but what they have a right to expect is a more than basic level of play which, up until the last few years, is what they've been getting. But there's also another aspect that needs to be addressed. 
The women's college basketball ratings this year were far higher than normal precisely because there seemed to be, as they say in professional wrestling, a real issue between the teams. It's the same reason women's MMA has done so well. Dana White borrowed heavily from Vince McMahon's playbook. That's why Ari Emanuel, who still hasn't come out of hiding yet, is going to buy WWE. In general, people will tune in to see two opponents face off against each other, though at best, that's only a display of skill and perhaps style. But far more people will tune in to see two people who have something personal against each other fight. Audiences want to know that there's something more at stake than just an athletic victory, that the athletes aren't just there because this is their job. That's why Ronda Rousey was a thing for a while. She trash-talked and all the rest of it. That's the part that trash-talking plays as far as building audience anticipation. Prior to athletes like, say, Muhammad Ali, the closest that you had to trash-talking was some guy out there saying, I'll beat so-and-so, or my name isn't Tommy Burns. By the way, Tommy Burns got the brakes beat off of him by Jack Johnson. It wasn't until Muhammad Ali came along that trash-talking became an art. And people realize, hey, there's something personal at stake here. Even if it's only the one guy who has nothing but pure contempt for his opponent, the audience just wants to see him shut up. You hear pro athletes say all the time that the way to show your opponent respect is by showing them no respect. That means you bring it. You get in their faces. You put up maximum opposition. Athletes understand this principle, as do audiences. That's what sportsmanship is in professional sports. So if this has been going on all along, if Caitlin Clark was doing a you-can't-see-me gesture on the court long before Angel Reese, then why are we seeing white racist reporters suddenly displaying phony outrage over a black female player simply doing what Caitlin Clark did? And they're also showing phony outrage because she was miming putting a ring on her own finger. LSU's football players, white football players by the way, have done that and nobody said boo. Because it's only wrong if black people do it. If black athletes are just sitting there, these racist white sports reporters will have something to say anyway. The racist Lena Dunham said that Odell Beckham Jr. made her feel uncomfortable because he didn't look at her. She went on this insane rant about all the things that she could just tell he was thinking because he didn't look in her direction. So all this is just white supremacists making stuff up, but since they own these sports leagues, the colleges, TV stations, and their surrounding advertisers, they can make their anti-black delusions into ammunition to attack us, which they do. But the LSU women's team won, and they did it in spectacular fashion. It wasn't even close. Iowa got stomped. It was a dominant defeat. So all the white media sports racists who were telling everyone how Caitlin Clark was the second coming, they look like the fools they are. Because if Caitlin Clark was such an awesome talent, then why was Angel Reese able to beat her so thoroughly? You can't claim to be the best unless you win. And Angel Reese won. Caitlin Clark didn't. And you can tell that burns these racist white sports writers live because they're seething right now. They absolutely hate it. They had convinced themselves that Iowa was going to win. At the very least, they convinced themselves that the black teams were going to lose. And here comes Angel Reese to be the dream killer. And that brings us to Keith Olbermann. Not exactly the first person that you would think of when it comes to the cabal of racist white sports writers, but uh, perhaps an asterisk needs to be put beside his name. He had what seemed to be a psychotic break the other day when he saw LSU's Angel Reese pointing at her finger before the end of the game saying, give me my ring. It was such an innocuous, harmless gesture, barely worth commenting on. Olbermann has always played the part of the white knight, pun intended, or at least he's presented himself that way, and always talked about how men should defer to women, how women ought not to be treated in a sexist manner, etc., etc., so... What does Keith Olbermann the chivalrous do when he sees a young black woman merely gesture to give her her ring? He goes on Twitter and posts, what a effing idiot. Keith Olbermann spent a lot of years setting the frame for what MSNBC would become. He was also instrumental in bringing in talent from the now defunct Air America radio station. People like Cenk Uger and the Young Turks, and most notably, Rachel Maddow. Olbermann had spent about two decades at ESPN being a sportscaster, and when he went over to MSNBC, he struggled for a while to find his voice, to find his lane. He finally struck pay dirt when he began doing special comments about the Bush administration, saying what he really thought about them. Though it was his special comment about W's intentional failure to respond to Hurricane Katrina that really put Olbermann on the map. 
After that, he was undoubtedly the star in the network, and the network went in the direction he was choosing. But there was trouble in paradise. Keith Oberman has always had something of a bad reputation among his co-workers. There were rumors that he had tried to get Chris Hayes fired. Oberman denies this. Though he doesn't deny that there's bad blood between him and Rachel Maddow and has been for over 10 years. Apparently, there was also tension and friction between him and other MSNBC anchors like Lawrence O'Donnell and, of course, various members of management. That's why Keith Oberman got shown the door. This is the real reason why he was so eager to say something when Tiffany Cross got fired. Something that you'll notice about a lot of people from the dominant society is that they can be as solidly for the establishment as you can want, but when this particular organization or that entity does something against them, they have no problem pretending to take the side of black people, especially if they think an accusation of racism can harm that entity or organization. Keith Olbermann falls in that category. While his various criticisms of how MSNBC handles itself may be valid, it doesn't erase the fact that the main reason that he criticizes them is because they kicked him out. Now, Keith Oberman has had a number of good takes over the years, which is why his despicable going in on Angel Reese came as a disgusting surprise to so many people. Because he has done some genuinely good work over the years, but then again, so did Rachel Maddow before she became MSNBC's $30 million woman. By the way, I remember Rachel Maddow when she was on Air America. She was one of the very few people who I genuinely felt was worth my time to listen to. At least, I felt that way at the time. But that was almost 20 years ago. A lot's changed since then, and not for the better. However, when the water crisis went down in Flint, Michigan, Rachel was one of the few people in the white media to cover it more than just in passing. Rachel Maddow's done good work, to be fair, just like Oberman had. But that was Rachel Maddow 1.0. Now she's Rachel 3.0, and the 3 stands for the $3 million she gets paid every month. Now her commentary is so boilerplate, so stale and trite, and so vapid that it's only good for putting you to sleep. Though that is a fair sight better than Keith Oberman's recent garbage hot takes. Oberman is in despair, and with good reason. He kept butting heads with MSNBC President Phil Griffin until he finally fired Oberman. Oberman then washed up at Al Gore's little TV experiment, Current TV, which looked as low rent as it was low IQ. He got canned from that one too. In the end, he wound up crawling back to ESPN, and then due to budget cuts, he got axed and hasn't had a show since. And by Oberman's own admission, he's been trying. He tried for two solid years to try to get MSNBC to take him back. When Rachel Maddow announced that she was stepping away from her weekday show schedule, Oberman hoped that he had finally found his opening to get back into the network. But according to Oberman himself, Rachel Maddow personally vetoed bringing him back. He claims that he had given an invitation to her to be a producer for his renewed show, and that she was actually turning down an F-ton of money. Well, apparently you couldn't pay Rachel Maddow to work with Keith Oberman again. Gee, I wonder why. The Rap reported that Keith Oberman has a reputation for being notoriously difficult to deal with. Other network executives feel the same way about him. And on top of that, even after all the head-butting that he's done over the years, he's never moderated. Keith Oberman has had a number of rotten takes before now. He infamously called the students at Penn State pitiful when a Penn State student sent him a link about their annual fundraiser for pediatric cancer. I suppose Penn State's motto is, we are, because that's what the student put in her tweet. Apparently, Oberman, who seems to always be looking for someone he can go off on, decided to show how clever he thought he was by responding to the tweet with the word pitiful, as if he was finishing the sentence, we are pitiful. Penn alumni objected to Oberman's unwarranted attacks on the students, and even the school's director of student television had to chime in asking why ESPN is allowing him to flame war with college kids and act like an angry teenager. This is how he reacts to an invitation to help out with pediatric cancer. Keep in mind, Keith Olbermann was in his 50s when this incident happened, but still acting and talking like a 13-year-old with no adult supervision. And obviously, he hasn't matured. ESPN suspended him for that stunt, and he posted a so-called apology, which everyone knew he didn't mean. He was probably told he better do it or he's out. 
Keith Oberman has been canned many times because he acts like Alec Baldwin, constantly looking for someone he can yell at or vent his rage on. And now with this latest stunt, he's put himself in the same shameful category as Skip Bayless and Don Imus. Except in the case of Don Imus, when he got in trouble for his racist remarks of the Rutgers women's basketball team, at least the wrinkled up racist had the good sense to pretend to be contrite afterwards. Keith Oberman hasn't even done that much. Even having Shaquille O'Neal call him out on Twitter wasn't enough for Keith Oberman to take a hint. Black people are the litmus test for whether somebody is a racist, or in the case of Oberman, has racist tendencies. Let a black person correct them, challenge them, or do something they don't like, and see how they react. See, Keith Oberman's problem is he's just like David Simon or Bill Maher. White so-called liberals who think that by not using the N-word or by occasionally saying something halfway sympathetic regarding black people or about the black struggle, that that gives them the right to bestow blanket amnesty on themselves for anything they say about a black person, no matter how vile. Because, hey, they can't be racist. Didn't you see Oberman rip W for his failure to respond to Katrina? Didn't you see how he stuck up for Tiffany Cross? That's the code of ethics at work here. They're playing a rhetorical white media game. Go ahead and say the occasional somewhat sympathetic thing about a black person. Why? Just pretend like you're sticking up for black people every once in a while. And now you'll have a pass. You'll have carte blanche to just go in on black people as much as you want to. Because, hey, you gave yourself cover. Keith Olbermann has a good television voice and he writes good copy occasionally. But he seems to think that because he made good money being a newscaster, that that meant he walks on water. And he doesn't. Oberman's track record of blowing every chance he's ever been given explains why he posted that podcast purporting to stick up for Tiffany Cross. He didn't give a rip about her. He didn't even know her. But he did see a chance to take the Shea Butter Twitter outrage and try to capitalize on it. In that podcast, he started off lamenting that Cross got crossed out, and then he immediately went into a long, rambling rant, grinding axes about his old grudges with Rachel Maddow, saying that she was so broke when he first brought her to MSNBC she didn't even have cab fare, and how he thought that Chris Hayes has really low ratings. Now, he couldn't say that Lawrence O'Donnell was broke. I, by the way, have no love or respect for Lawrence O'Donnell. So instead, Oberman said that Lawrence was conniving against him. Gee, seems like there's nobody at MSNBC that he has any regard for at all. Drama, infighting, acrimony, turmoil, they seem to follow him wherever he goes. So this is the guy who admits that he doesn't know anything about hoops, but then out of nowhere decides to post a profane tweet calling a college kid an effing idiot. I can't think of when he's gotten so personal with another athlete in any arena. Certainly not with a white one. Sure, he's had some colorful language for some Bush administration officials, but never for a college kid. And the fact that he didn't even bother to do the slightest of research on the situation that he was choosing to comment on, well, it just goes to show that the white right aren't the only ones who have a bad habit of talking about things they know absolutely nothing about. And rather than apologize, Oberman chose to whitesplain, and that's the part that shows his true colors. It was not just that stupid, asinine, belligerent tweet that made it where this guy is certified racist sympathizer. The problem is how he responded to it. There's no ESPN to force him to give an apology on this one, so he's not. At this point, though, I think Keith Oberman has resigned himself to his fate. He said as much that there's no chance of him coming back to MSNBC. He's 64 now, closer to retirement age than anything else. No network who picks him up would do it with a 10 or even 5 year deal. Olbermann's not a guy who you can build a network around. He's too old. So I guess he figures since there's no point in trying to tone down his behavior, there's no benefit that he can get from it, he might as well just be who he is. And that's what he's showing everyone. Given his track record, I'm not going to say that Keith Olbermann is necessarily a full-blown racist, but it was not just his bizarre and peculiar outburst at a black girl that was disgusting. It was the fact that he didn't even have the integrity to apologize afterwards. Because he's not sorry. There's no ESPN holding a pink slip over his head this time, and he has no hope of getting on with any other network, so why should he pretend to be sorry for actions that he's not sorry for? The best that he was willing to do was to say, oh well, if Caitlin Clark did that, then they're both wrong. As if his uncontrollable profane outburst at a black girl was the result of him just being so stricken with the fact that what he sees as the norms and mores of good sportsmanship were being trampled upon.
But if he truly believes that they were both wrong, gee, he didn't seem to have any curse words for Caitlin Clark. So any one of the Shea Butter buffoons who thought the Keith Oberman's podcast about Tiffany Cross meant that he genuinely had nothing against black women, what do you say now? But the dumb does not fall far from the tree because not to be outdone, the Biden White House couldn't help but get involved. The first crone, Jill Biden, said she wanted to invite the Iowa team to the White House. She actually said that. She said that she had been at the championship game and she supported the Iowa team, who just so happens to be almost entirely white, though I'm sure that's just a coincidence. So since the team she wanted to win lost, she's now telling everyone that she thinks they ought to be invited to the White House. That suggestion was so ridiculous, even Caitlin Clark herself had to say LSU should be the only ones who go to the White House. The LSU women's team are disgusted with Jill Biden's unprecedented disrespect towards them, and rightly so. Reese herself said she's not going, and that would be the proper response to this. They should, as a team, announce that they reject the White House's invitation to visit because of Jill Biden. They're in a position to impose consequences for this, high-profile consequences. Because as the firestorm over Jill Biden's idiocy began to spread the last couple of days, she had one of her press secretaries come out and give an empty, meaningless, clearly insincere word salad about applauding all women athletes and Jill Biden looking forward to celebrating LSU at the White House. Gee, that sounds just like Oberman's white splaining about, well, both of them are wrong. Except Jill Biden didn't applaud all women athletes. She only applauded the white ones. Jill Biden has offered no apology. Though even if she did, it wouldn't be worth the breath she used to give it. Jill Biden is vile, just like her husband. She didn't offer an apology to the LSU women's team. Not even her press secretary did. And we know better than to accept some non-apology apology. Jill Biden herself should have been the one to publicly and personally do a mea culpa on this. Instead, she chose to hide behind her front woman, which is what racists and liars do when they don't want to have to say something. They get one of their stooges to do it for them. However, I've been amused to see that people have been reminding Jill Biden that Donald Trump came in second in the election, so shouldn't she be inviting him to the White House? Doesn't he deserve to be there as much as Biden? Because after all, we're recognizing all participants now, right? This is her doing the athletic equivalent of all lives matter. That's supposed to be her cleaning up her mess. For all you Biden bots out there, all you Negroes who made excuses for voting for him, this is what you voted for. The white media praised black women for turning out in numbers to support Biden. Black women put Biden in the White House, they said. Well, we warned you that there would be no gratitude for this. We told you that the level of disrespect from Biden would only go up as a result of voting him into office. And here it is. When you reward someone for abusing you, then what you get is more abuse. Tell me, how is this any different than what you would expect from, say, Donald Trump and Melania if they were still in the White House? We all know Trump is racist and that if Melania was still the first skank, she would be congratulating the Iowa team, too. And Jill Biden has done the same thing as them. So all you clowns who said that Biden was going to be different, why have you all been so quiet for the last two and a half years? We've been chronicling the constant disrespect from this man and his refusals to do anything for black people, and now we can add his wife to that list. Not that it's any kind of surprise. Well, I've got news for Jill Biden and the rest of the heartbroken haters out there in the white media. If the Iowa women's basketball team was so great... Then why did they lose? And why did they lose by such a definitive number? All that they proved is that the old biblical saying is true. A haughty spirit before a fall and pride goeth before destruction. Caitlin Clark was the one who was celebrating too early. Angel Reese waited until she had the win in her hand before she started celebrating. LSU played with class and they played with verve. They played like they wanted to win. They played like athletes. Iowa simply played like they wanted to play. All these undercover bigots have gotten triggered because these black girls beat them at their own game, literally. Nothing matters except success. Nobody cares about the runners-up. That's what eats these racist white sports writers alive. They know that nobody will care about their racist hot takes about black athletes. They can throw all the racial dog whistles they want. All that matters is who wins, because that's what people ultimately remember. People will remember that LSU won a championship, 
And this time next year, they won't even remember who LSU beat. Because the ethos of capitalism is results-based. Winner take all. Well, LSU's women's basketball team took it all. And they earned every bit of it. And I'm glad the white racist sports writers are furious. These black athletes don't do their talking on a blog or a sports page or a sports show. The black athletes do their talking on the court, the gridiron, and the ring. That's why the black athletes are champions, and the racist white sports writers are grinding their crooked little teeth. As people get older, they tend to be very unguarded with what they say, and the reason why is nobody wants to spend their entire life not saying exactly what they think exactly the way that they think it. Now that he's up there in years, people are finding out exactly what kind of person Keith Olbermann is. And as for Keith Olbermann, he's finding out the answer to the age-old question, what takes a lifetime to build and only a moment to destroy? The answer? Your reputation. Hell, at this point, Oberman might as well let it all hang out, act like the moron he is, and then refuse to admit that he was wrong afterwards. Why not? He has no job prospects, nobody's willing to work with him, and there's nothing he can do about it. At this point, he has nothing left to lose. He threw it all away a long time ago. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Cloud Walker Z, Reginald Caldwell, James Dinkins, Mouse, and Eric Bailey. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.